All right, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Computer Networks. Um, in specific, we are talking about routing protocols. And we are on to link state, leaving distance vector behind um, and talking about OSPF a little bit. As always, we're using our Computer Networks of Systems Approach book by Peterson and Davey, and you can get it online here. Um, so, so let's get started. So OSPF, um, or link state routing, is, is a major interdomain networking protocol. And, and the idea, the major difference between this and what we were using is that instead of just kind of getting an updated picture from your neighbors, um, there is a flooding mechanism. So, so what I do is I send my forwarding table out to B and C like before, but now B and C are responsible for sending out my forwarding table to all of their neighbor, neighbors. So B will send it out to D and C, um, and when C receives it, it will send it out as well. And this, this floods A's forwarding table out to everyone. And when you do that, uh, and here's here's an example of the, the flooding mechanism here. And when you do that, everyone on the entire network gets a, a picture of every single vector, distance vector, that originates from everyone. So D will learn exactly what X is seeing. Um, and X will learn exactly what D is seeing. And so everyone gets a full picture of the entire network. And that changes things because now instead of kind of guessing at what that picture might be based on what I'm seeing from my neighbors, I can more directly compute my fastest route directly. Instead of, instead of kind of updating in this regular way, I can just compute my fastest route. So how do we compute that? Um, let's use a sample network like this. Um, and, and it uses a, a version of the Dijkstra's algorithm, which you might have learned um, in one of your other classes somewhere. Um, but basically the idea is this, and, and we're gonna start from, from D. Um, D knows that it can get to itself from free, for free. And it also knows this entire picture with costs of the entire internet, okay? And so what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, all right, let's look at the things that I'm directly connected to. Um, that's B and C. So we're gonna consider that my tentative cost to B is 11, and my tentative cost to C is two. Out of all the things that I can tentatively get to, which one is the cheapest? In this case, it's the path from D to C. That's a cost of two. So then I'm going to enter C as confirmed. So now I am confirming the fact that the path from D to C is to send information directly to C. Okay. And then what I do is I pick something in the confirmed list. Um, in this case, C is the only thing I haven't looked at yet. And I see what the tentative paths are now. So my tentative paths are D to B for 11, D to A for a cost of 12, D to B for a cost of five. And I say, which of those is the cheapest? Well, it's 11, 12, and five. So five is the cheapest. So I'm gonna add B to my confirmed list. Um, when I do that, I note that I'm going to B through C. Now there is a path directly from D to B, but it's cheaper to go through C. Maybe this is some sort of phone link and these are super high speed links or something, you know, something cool like that. And so when I confirm this, um, now B needs to be looked at to see what new paths it might add. So it says, well, um, my tentative list is now um, B to A, going from, from D to B to A, which would be a cost of 10, or going from D to C to A for a cost of 12. So 10 is cheaper. And so I add the route from D to A, which sends traffic through C through B through A, and that ends up costing me 10. And then I enter this into the confirmed list and then we're done. And so what I've done is I formed a tree that tells me what the cheapest costs are to get from D to A. Um, and it's always correct. If I'm always adding this minimum node here, then it will always be correct. Um, and, and this is a form of the Dijkstra's algorithm. We're using more information than perhaps Dijkstra just gives us in, in raw form. Um, but it's the same idea. And, and you can see kind of this path, right? We first kind of set D as confirmed. We look at the possible places D can get to, which was B and C, take the cheapest one, we add it here. We update that with the information from C, which allows us to get to B much cheaper. A costs 12, so we add the B one because it's the cheapest one. Um, and then we still have this path from A to 12. We look at B here and we learn that we can get to A cheaper if we go through that, so, so we do that. Um, and then eventually you see that you just send all your traffic through C. Um, <laughs> And, and that's from, from this link. You can walk through this in the book. Um, that's from this link D. The cost from D to, to B is too expensive. 
So we eventually, and the cost from C to A is too expensive. So we eventually just send everything in a line here. Now that might look different for a different network if we were to use the other network from last time. Um, but hopefully you get the sense of how Dijkstra's algorithm works. Um, again, Dijkstra's is also only a few lines of code long. Um, it's pretty elegant. It's pretty amazing. Um, Dijkstra also had some interesting ideas about things. Um, link state tends to converge a little more quickly than, than distance vector. Um, it does have this issue of, of figuring out infinities when things break down and whatnot. Um, and, and, and so there are some other kind of things out there that, that, that we will eventually talk about briefly about, about why, why some of this is happening. Let's talk about some things about, um, OSPF directly. So this open shortest path first protocol is, is the one that, that is using distance vector, link state is using link state, RIP uses <laughs> distance vector. So SPF, um, one thing that's important when you have routers all across your network sending these messages, one thing that's important is to have authentication um, because you don't want someone plopping a router down, connecting it up, and then kind of poisoning your network with bad packets and information. So these routers need to know who each other are, need to be able to trust each other so that they can actually build the network that they want. And so SPF um, has has an authentication protocol built into it. Um, and, and it was kind of weak at first, but it's been strengthened. Um, another cool feature of OSPF um, is that it has some additional hierarchy tools. And this kind of leads into um, something that we're going to talk about next week, next time. Um, it's, in, it's in the next section in different ways. But having a, pro having a hierarchy where, let's see, where perhaps like this part of the internet that maybe there's a huge part of the internet behind A and there's a huge part of the internet behind C, but I've kind of kind of doing those separately with different OSPF protocols um, can limit the number of the the distance that you have to flood things and prevent your flooding from having having to push like really deep into a network, you know, 16 hops long or something. Um, and instead we'll just kind of segment out areas. And this this hierarchy is important. It becomes important for for the entire internet. Um, and there are protocols that govern it. So, so we'll talk about that again uh, next time. Uh, and another cool thing is load balancing, which is the idea that if you have two paths that cost the same, so like maybe in this case, X can get to be um, through two different paths and maybe they cost the same, um, then OSPF would allow you to send traffic both ways, right? To, to kind of utilize both networks. Um, and that's that's pretty cool, and and that might be one reason why your trace route has a couple different paths. If, if if folks are using OSPF and they have some load balancing built in, um, another cool thing that shows up in this section of the book is is they do a pretty long talk about ARPANET and and how we figure out what some of these link costs are, and some of the research that's been done kind of in the early days of the internet to kind of directly compute these link costs either using queue sizes or, or anything like that. It turns out that these dynamic protocols um, ended up almost always having some issues of some sort or another. And across most platforms, these are kind of configured by administrators to be static. Um, one, one thing that they might use is one over the link bandwidth. So if you can imagine you had a two gigabit per second um, link and a one gigabit per second link that were both kind of connecting to the same place in some way, um, the costs of, of those paths. So let's say, you know, the path to A is, is one gigabit per second, but the path to C is two gigabits per second from X. Um, so I might say the cost from X to A is one, but the cost from X to C is one half. So this is one divided by one, this is one divided by two. And so I would prefer to send things this way um, based on the total path cost, right? So, so if A to B was then two gigabits per second and C to B was one, then my total path would be one and a half this way and one and a half this way. So so one over the link bandwidth has kind of become standard. Sometimes they'll add constants in there. Like if I have to pay somebody extra to send over their link A, I might put a higher constant there, even though it's technically cheaper um, or something like that. So, so this is kind of cool. Um, one of the things that's kind of happened though, is that these things have kind of become static instead of using some of the dynamic stuff that has been researched in ARPANET. And if you're really curious about this, you should go in and read about that stuff. It's, it's super cool. Um, it's super fun to see what kind of mistakes were made and, and how some of those decisions caused traffic to bounce all over the place, like either flooding a network and leaving other networks open and, and stuff like that. Um, and one cool thing that the book does say um, is, is this KISS principle, this keep it simple, stupid. It, it's amazing how many times um, that we go back and kind of lean on these simple algorithms that are really tight um, because we know they work and, and they're really efficient. 
Um, the other thing that this also leans on is that computer science and computer systems um, often rely on kind of getting uh, an algorithm deployed quickly. You know, it's a fail fast and learn quickly sort of idea. Um, and once once you fail, you can kind of iteratively develop and, and, and make something better. And so these two things are actually kind of core pieces of, of things that I like to think about when I'm writing algorithms or, or doing computer science, which is let's fail quickly. Let's, let's write an algorithm, get it wrong, and let's fix it. Um, but at the same time, remembering that like the simplest solution is probably the best one. Okay, we're out of time for this video. Um, hope you had a good time. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you all next time. Bye.